I'm doing something a little bit different for this video than I did for the last few, and that's that while the last few games I've played, La La Land and Super Zalixer and A Night in the Woods are games that I really, really like, uh, this time I'm playing a game that's probably one of my favorite games ever, and that's problematic, and I, I don't really make that statement just kind of off the cuff, I've really spent a lot of time thinking about this game, ruminating on this game, ever since I played it in 2013, and it's kind of gone nowhere but up in my esteem the more I've played it, the more I've thought about it, rather. I just... it keeps sticking in my mind in a really powerful way, and even though I've only played through it once, it's just stuck in my brain space. I can't stop kind of going back to it and the things it does and what it does differently from other games and what makes it so just intoxicating to me and what makes Problematic so interesting. And I think I've honed in on two of the things that have made it resonate with me so long. And the first is that it's completely abstract in the sense that it doesn't rely on any like real contextualization with like creating aliens or aliens or people or cutscenes, any kind of context for the visuals or what's happening. And that's what I mean when I say that it's completely abstract. It is basically communicating purely in the language of video games, of systems and mechanics and how the player interacts with a specific world. And the second is that the um, second thing that interests me a lot about it is that while it's doing that, it still is not, is first and foremost designed as a piece of art, rather than like a fun puzzle game first and a piece of art second or in concurrence. Like many of my favorite games are designed, are like really fun puzzle games. Like Shadow of the Colossus is a really fun puzzle game, kind of almost first and foremost. And I think that's extremely valuable and part of what makes it so strong. And the themes and the story it tells are married very deeply to what Shadow of the Colossus is. But it's still, first and foremost, is that game about going to the 16 Colossi and fighting the bosses and having a blast doing it. And the tragic underpinnings of that story are very resonant, but it still doesn't feel like the primary point in the same way that problematic relies on that. And something similar is like Braid, which is feels like a puzzle game. And not knocking those styles, like I say that's some of my favorite games ever, but the combination in problematic of the completely abstract systems approached game design combined with the complete focus on telling a certain story makes it kind of you not completely unique but a very honed in unique kind of ex game experience and I can think of only a handful of other games that kind of work along the same lines like La La Land which I played earlier which I think I enjoy a lot although I don't think it's quite as focused or honed as the story espoused in Problematic um Maricopas's Limb, which is very similar in a lot of ways, but also a lot easier to kind of wrap your brain around. And Yume Nikki, which is one of uh, Liz Ryerson's documented inspirations. And here I'm going to pause a little second because this is where the game gets really dark. This is the part of the game where it starts to reveal its hand a little bit. 
I think that it's pretty obvious just from the tagline of the game, which is problematic as a game about prisons, real and imaginary, that it's a game about subconscious problems, maybe subconscious trauma, and dealing with that. But I think at this, this is the point of the game where with between the hellish imagery and the single lone cross that has been committing violence on us throughout the rest of the game, the single lone cross that hones in on us and is horrible, um, that problematic starts to really reveal what it's about, and that's that at least in part problematic is a game about rape and more specifically it's about trauma and cycles of abuse and gender and I think as the game progresses it's very clear that that is absolutely what the game is about at least in part I think just making unilateral statements like that might not be completely with the spirit of the game, but because it's just so raw and how it's put together, but that is definitely an underlying thread of the experience. And this is this area with the dim music and the hellish background is where that starts to come into focus. Which is also why the game is kinda of altering a bit and moving on into its next act. And it's even clearer when you kind of get to here. And this is the part of the game where there's actually like obstacles. And I never actually figured out the puzzle for this room. I don't actually know how I did it. I messed around for about six minutes or so. I trimmed it down a little bit. I was gonna address the idea that this is all just somehow incomprehensible nonsense or stuff that's put together to make the person look smart or that's that is pretentious basically and I don't, I don't even think that line of thought is worth addressing basically I think it's very self-evidently insipid to look at something that's obviously very thoughtfully put together and personal and purposeful like this and that's the only place your mind can go. I think it's just kind of sad. And I haven't seen any, like, critics do that. All I've seen are just, like, game jolt commenters, and it just makes me feel kind of sad <laughs> to know that that's all some people get out of this. But, um... I mentioned the cross symbols earlier, um, during the Red Room, that uh, are, are important symbols and problematic, and I'm passing by one now. And I think they're very valuable because they're kind of like a, here we're being swarmed by them, they're kind of like a microcosm of what Problematic is kind of trying to do in a lot of ways. And that's that in a traditional video game, you would introduce enemies like the cross symbols. and coming into contact or being hurt by them in some way would result in a negative consequence and it would be something the player would desire not to do. And in Problematic, there is a negative consequence, and that's the unpleasant screen shaking combined with the very unpleasant noise. And you're nearing the end of Act 1 of Act 1 of 3. And the the thing is that the cross symbols are also, it is important, you have to use the cross symbols in order to solve certain puzzles, like you saw me in a couple of the previous rooms climbing up with the cross symbols to get to where I needed to go. And from a game design perspective, that doesn't make any sense. They're we're taught these consequences for engaging with these enemies and then we're forced to ignore those consequences in order to progress. And, like I said, from a game design perspective, it doesn't really make sense. Like, you, it's not something you'd see in a Mario game, is what I mean. You wouldn't get to the next level by running into a Goomba and falling down to level 3-2. But, that's what Problematic does. So the fact that it's not really there 
as to make sense from like a fun perspective, you have to think, okay, why is it that way then? Why do I have to rely on these cross symbols that are clearly supposed to be enemies? And that's when you start a tr kind of tapping into what problematics tr actually trying to do. And the cross symbols are basically in place to teach us that sometimes we have to rely on these things that cause us pain. And it incorporates those cross symbols into a bunch of other little micro scenes that come together to give the game so much of its thematic breath, breadth. And all of the little moments like right here. Like, here's another section. I wander, I'm wandering around for like a minute before I kind of figure out where to go next in the hub level. And, or how about all of the foreground images that do nothing but obscure the very, the world of the puzzles. Like, why is that the way it is? If we are just going by... <laughs> I, I love the just upfrontness of this room. Um, if we're just g viewing it as like checkbox game criticism, then all we're, we're not going to come up with anything valuable. We're just going to say, oh, this is wrong. This is not how it's supposed to be done. And that is worthless. That's a worthless approach. Is just to view all games criticism as a checkbox. So, in order to actually engage with problematic, you have to go okay, why is it like this? What is that trying to tell me by obscuring the action with foreground elements and changing what tiles mean what and what I can walk behind, what I can stand on, not making it immediately obvious what's solid and what's not, not making all of the puzzles basically like incomprehensible almost and really only solvable with kind of unexplainable leaps of intuition. That's why I struggle with so many of these puzzles going through them again. Hell, the first time I played through the game, it took me... Well, the first time I tried playing the game, it I got probably 20 minutes in and quit because I think I got stuck in a puzzle. And the second time I played, I got to that room we were just in and spent like hours... Not an hour, not hours. I spent probably about 20 minutes trying to get past it and then couldn't figure it out and then dropped the game again. And then like six months later I picked it up again just intent to finish play through the whole thing and I did. I played through the whole thing. There weren't any walkthrough videos on new on YouTube at the time so I just had to kind of bash my head against it. And that all plays into just kind of the nature of the story of the game. Why why are these puzzles so difficult to wrap your brain around, so kind of incomprehensible? And it just plays... It's all kind of part of the narrative of the game. You just have to contextualize it and recognize what it's trying to do in any given scene and try to put all that together into something that makes thematic sense to you and I think that's really cool that a game like Problematic exists, that games like Problematic exist and I'm really looking forward to more games like them in the future. Oh, this was another challenging room to figure out but I managed to get through it here pretty quickly and I can't believe I've almost gone the whole video and not mentioned the Immaculate soundtrack which was also composed by Liz Ryerson. Uh, she comes from kind of a musician background, and you can see, can almost see that in the game, just with how it almost feels constructed around the moods created by the music. And you can see a little bit of that in her other game responsibilities. And it's just really powerful, and is what gives the game its kind of emotional teeth, I think. And. I think we can kind of cut off in this at the end of this room for now um, because we're kind of near the end of 15 minutes and it's a very long game so there's still a lot more to play so I can't really feasibly commentate over all of it for just a little one-off video 
and just doing this amount of commentary has actually been pretty emotionally draining, so I think I'll cut it off here. But, yeah, that's problematic. It's a game that abandons the confines of traditional narrative and instead uses striking images and mechanics to share complex ideas on an unconscious level. It's frustrating and long, and playing it made me feel scared, uncomfortable, and lonely. And it's also a moving and deeply human piece of art. I really love this game a lot, and I hope that you've gotten some kind of value in my weird little off-the-cuff thoughts on it. So, thank you. Thanks for watching.